So check this out. In the early 1900s, uh, we were just, just beginning to understand how stars work. And, and we really hadn't figured out that whole like nuclear fusion thing, uh, but we were beginning to classify stars. And we had finally come up with a halfway decent classification scheme, which put small stars, uh, they were red, they were dim, they were small, and then there were medium stars that were like yellowish or whitish, and then there were giant stars that were very, very hot and very, very blue. We didn't understand like the connection between these, if they represent diff the same star, but in different kind stages of its life cycle or different kinds of star. We didn't know all that yet, but at least the universe was beginning to make sense. If you see a red star, it is small and it is dim. And yes, there were also the red giant stars, which were another like vague mystery, but that problem was over there. In general, there was this main sequence of small red, medium white, and then large blue. And then came the white dwarfs. Right, and it was almost an accident. Like, like uh, the the surveys they were doing surveys of small red stars and just tallying things and like, oh, let's 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 catalog some more small red stars over there, and then some small stars over there, and then some small stars over here, and then like, yep, they're all red and they're all red, and then this one's white and this one's right away. Hold up, <laughs> uh, some of the small stars that we are observing were white, which meant they were hot. They were not cool, they were not dim, they were not red, they were bright and white and hot. And this was a big mystery. This was like the big hot topic in the early 20th century is what are these white dwarfs? And as astronomers started to study white dwarfs in more detail, they, <laughs> it, it, it just got even weirder because we were able to finally get the density of the white dwarfs. Uh, we were able to find some, we were able to get their absolute distance and or, or their distance. And once you knew their distance, you can get their absolute brightness and then you could record their uh, temperature. And once you know their temperature based on their color, you can calculate their surface area. That gives you a radius. That gives you a volume. And then if there's an orbiting companion, you can figure out its mass. And from there, you can get its density. And the density was off the charts, whatever the heck of these white dwarf stars were. Like, you know how nowadays we talk all about black, uh, black holes and how they're mysterious and don't make any sense. This was the black hole of the early 20th century. This was the discussion in early 20th century astronomy. What are these strange objects? And there's this amazing quote that I love that I'm going to read it to you. This is from Sir Arthur Eddington, absolutely famous, brilliant astronomer in the early 20th century. He had this to say about white dwarfs. He said, we learn about the stars by receiving and interpreting the messages which their light brings us. The message of the companion of Sirius, which was a white dwarf, when it was decoded, ran, quote, I am composed of material 3,000 times denser than anything you have ever come across. A ton of my material would be a little nugget that you could put in a matchbox, end quote. What reply can one make to such a message? The reply which most of us made in 1914 was, shut up, don't talk nonsense. <laughs> That was the response of astronomers when they first began to observe white dwarfs. So they're just like, nature, can you please stop? This is a bit much. This is weird. We don't understand it. The person to crack it, there were a few people that were inching on the way to crack it. But the real person that finally got it right was an amazing astronomer, physicist, uh, Subramanian Chandra Sekhar, who, who grew up in India, then got a scholarship to go to Oxford. And on the boat ride over to England to start graduate school, he wasn't even in grad school yet. He hadn't even started working on his PhD yet. He ended up working on something during that boat ride that would eventually win him the Nobel Prize in physics. Doesn't exactly happen nowadays, but hey. Um, so Subramanian and Chandrasekhar realizing he's a brilliant mathematical physicist and understanding how white dwarfs work it takes intense mathematical insight and that's exactly what he had. And he was able to combine two of the hottest topics in physics at the time, the topic of quantum mechanics and the topic of special relativity. He was able to put these together 
and use this to explain another hot topic in astronomy, which was the nature of white dwarfs. And he realized that white dwarfs can be explained as being an object that is not being held up, is not supported by what we normally consider as the forces of nature. Instead, white dwarfs are made of material that is crammed so tightly together that the electrons themselves that were a part of all the atoms in the plasma that made up the star, instead are so crammed so tightly together that there is this weird quantum mechanical effect known as degeneracy pressure, which basically means electrons can't squeeze down very close together. It's just like a hard limit on how close you can squeeze electrons together. And in this isn't just because of their electric repulsion. You know, they have the same charges, so they don't like to get closer. No, no, no. This is much, much more powerful than that, much more fundamental to that than that. This is this is real quantum mechanics here. And it is this degeneracy pressure that is able to support the white dwarf against further gravitational collapse. And using this insanely complicated mathematics, he was able to explain all the observations of the relationships between white dwarf sizes and temperatures and brightness levels. Like he was able to, to solve it. Like, okay, this is what a white dwarf is. It is an object that is so compact that electrons themselves are doing the work of supporting the star. This idea received a lot of pushback, which Subramanian Chandrasekhar has mused later uh, in later decades said I was probably racially motivated. Okay, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. There, there was a lot of pushback on his idea because it was so radical, it was so extreme, and there was a limit. Subramanian Chandra Sekar was able to realize that there is a limit to how much these electrons can support. That if you cram material in too tightly beyond a certain mass, then that electron degeneracy pressure gets overwhelmed and the white dwarf can collapse. And then there's no other known force of nature that could continue to support that object, which means if you take a white dwarf, and it exceeds a certain mass, which is 1.44 times the mass of the sun, it will just keep collapsing and collapsing and collapsing and will form a black hole. Now, in the early 20th century, we had known that black holes were an artifact of Einstein's theory of general relativity, but we didn't really want them to exist because they were too freaky to allow in our universe. So no astronomer thought that black holes actually existed. But we also wanted to explain why white dwarfs exist. And the best explanation for how white dwarfs work opened a door to the possibility of the existence of black holes. Because now you have a thing, and but there's a limit to how big they can get. And if they get bigger, then you might just have black holes. And we never observed a white dwarf bigger than this limit. So you're like, oh... If this is really how white dwarfs work, then maybe black holes exist, but we don't want black holes to exist. So maybe this isn't how white dwarfs work. But Chandra Sekhar's math was too good. It lined up with observations. He eventually got the Nobel Prize for it. He did a ton of other amazing work. He's a brilliant physicist. And it cracked the door open for black holes. Unless, unless there was something else to stop it, but that is next week's show. And yes, I know my chalkboard is a little bit different because this is such a cool drawing. I couldn't resist. Uh, I, I couldn't resist leaving it up. I wanted to erase it and do my normal ask. I just couldn't. I just couldn't. It was too good. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe and go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. It really does keep these this show going. It's my job. It's what I do. And it's fun. And I'll see you next week where I'm going to talk about neutron stars. Go away now.